Hey, welcome everyone to this webinar co-hosted by AgeWell and the AHSN Network. This is part of our International Innovation Exchange webinar series. And today we have three great speakers discussing the role of robotics in supporting care for older adults. Uh, my name is Michael Krastowski. I am the Business Development and Industry Relations Manager at AgeWell, and we are Canvas Technology and Aging <clears throat> Network. We're happy to have you here. Uh, we're looking forward to a great session today. And I'm going to just make a quick note to let you know you can enter questions anytime in the Q&A uh, section in Zoom, or if you prefer in the chat, we will leave the questions until after the three talks are done. And I will help moderate those once we finish the talks. And at this point, I'd just like to hand it off to Nigel Harris. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay, just... Uh... Okay, so I'm Nigel Harris. I'm Director of Innovation and Growth with the West of England Academic Health Science Network. And I'm here representing the whole of the Academic Health Science Network. And we have 15 um, uh, regional centres uh, around England. Uh, so welcome if you're new uh, and it, it's great to see you. This is actually the, the third of our uh, seminar series. Um, so although we've got talks today from the west and southwest of England, of course, there's a lot of robotics activity going on around the whole of the UK. And I just wanted to spend a, a few minutes just giving you a, a feel of some of the work that's going on so that you can pick up on activities that are going on in some of our other regional centres and other AHSNs. Um, so I guess the, the go to place about any uh, robotics work in the UK is the UK Robotics and Autonomous Systems Network. And this was set up in 2015 by our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, there are 32 partner universities and two doctoral training centers. And of course the work spans the whole of robotics. So that could be autonomous vehicles or nuclear de decommissioning as well as, as health. Um, but obviously health and care is also a, a major theme within the network. And there are some really useful publications that you can pick up on. Um, so this was a publication from uh, 2017. In fact, Praminda Caleb Solly, uh, one of our speakers, co-authored the report, looking at the connected care ecosystem for independent living. And it's a, a, a really uh, useful scene setting document that just sets out some of the research challenges that you can see here uh, 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 that we need to address if we're gonna be able to take forward this technology and to use it in practice. And you see, I've, uh, I've got, you've got the link and the URL uh, on the slides, uh, which you can pick up on. Um, I also wanted to um, highlight uh, some robotics for care activity in particular centers in the UK. And this is by no means comprehensive, um, but it's work where we know there are researchers that are particularly active. Um, so working from clockwise, from the bottom left, going round, of obviously we've got uh, Hannah uh, and, and, uh, and the team over at uh, Plymouth there, uh, Ray Jones. We've got Preminder and colleagues at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, uh, just down the road from where we are. Um, then we've got um, the uh, Sheffield Hallam University Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. Um, so they've got a lot of work uh, going on around um, evaluating um, digital technology and health uh, products for people with disabilities, uh, along with the sister institute in Sheffield, a CATCH, which is the Centre for Assistive Technology and Connected Healthcare. And that's led by uh, Professor Mark Hawley, uh, with a strong interest in people with frailty. Uh, round, round the top, just being UK wide, obviously not in England, uh, we've got the centre up in Edinburgh, uh, Mario Dragoni. And they've got a, a really neat living lab to, to facilitate uh, user-centered uh, design and testing of innovative solutions. Um, there's a large group at Leeds um, and they have a, a, an assistive and rehabilitative robotics uh, center. And there's Raymond Holt and, and Rory O'Connor there. And then coming back down to Hertfordshire, which is just outside London, um, there is a, a robot house at the University of, of Hertfordshire. Uh, which is a, a, a showcase site. And then finally, right at the bottom we have in London, uh, we've got Imperial College and Helen Hamlin Centre and the um, 
uh, the Dyson School for Engineering Design. And there's a lot of uh, interest there around the sort of physical aspects of robotic design uh, and testing and prototyping. So that just gives you an idea of some of the, the more active centres around the UK. You've got the URLs there that you can pick up on. Or if you want a particular introductions, you can, if you go to the uh, to our uh, innovation exchange at the Academic Health Science Network um, and ping us an email, we'd be very happy to, to introduce you to the researchers. And then just finally, uh, 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 quite a useful publication that sets the scene around the, the challenges of deploying the technology and, and using it to support health and care. Um, here in the West of England, we sponsored an event uh, back last year, a uh, part of our Future of Care series. And then there's a report here around the future of, 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 of care using robotics and autonomous systems. So that's, a, again, a really useful uh, uh, publication, just gives you a snapshot there. So um, that's our introduction. So let's um, hand over now to our speakers. And I'm really pleased uh, to introduce Francois Michaud. Um, uh, Francois um, is a particular interest around robot, mobile robotics and telepresence and associated tools. So um, over to you, Francois. All right. Can you see my screen? Is it OK? Yeah, yeah all, all good. right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, the, um, the purpose of my presentation is basically to outline what we are doing in terms of engineering. I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm designing robots, interactive robots uh, that are targeting to be used in the real world. Uh, so the focus is going to be on telepresence robotics and the, the work that we've done uh, in this area, trying to make them more autonomous. And we're going to be focusing on two uh, more specific technologies that are kinds of spin-offs of uh, what we've done over the years. Uh, one is called OpenTerra. Uh, OpenTerra is a, an open source uh, telecommunication framework that allows to transmit audio, video, and data. Data that allows to control robots, but can also be used uh, for telehealth uh, purposes. And I'm going to talk about MapIt. MapIt is a spin-off of the robot navigation software that we developed. Uh, it's called RTAM Map. And it's basically because we've showed uh, we've shown the uh, the uh, what we were doing with telepresence robotics and autonomous navigation to OTs that the idea of using this for home assessment came up. So uh, I'm going to be presenting that and uh, some of the work that we are currently doing in the next uh, 15 minutes. So um, let's start by just giving you highlights of what are telepresence robots. Uh, here are four examples. Uh, the Beam Plus from Suitable Technologies uh, is no longer commercialized. Double, uh, Temi, and OmniLab. What they all have in common is that the intelligence is left in the head of the operator, and the operator has to do everything. There's some uh, ideas or functionalities that uh, are being developed and tried uh, with these robots trying to make them more, more autonomous, but that's the target, basically making them more autonomous so that the operator can focus on what's going on rather than on controlling the robot uh, from a distance. So uh, to give you uh, some idea, in 2017, uh, through the AgeWell project that we had, um, we uh, augmented a Beam Plus platform by adding a, uh, a Kinect camera for a, a 3D uh, perspective, a visual perspective of the world. We also added a um, microphone array. The microphone array is, a, is, in this case, it's eight microphones that allows to localize, track, and separate sound sources. So the robot has an idea of where the sound is coming from and can focus on uh, specific uh, sound sources like voice from people and get uh, a recognition rate more uh, higher uh, recognition rate. Obviously, when you're developing a, a mobile telepresence platform, you need to do vi basic video conferencing uh, uh, services, but also we added interaction modalities to it. So, for instance, uh, autonomous face tracking. So the, the remote operator just activate this mode and the robot is going to be tracking uh, the visual faces around it uh, autonomously. 
same with voice so if you have two people talking or multiple uh people talking the robot can position itself in the direction of the person talking so again the operator is now being able to more to focus more on what's going on rather than moving the robot uh, from left to right continuously one thing that uh, also that we can do is we can connect the robot to uh, bluetooth uh, medical uh, devices uh, portable medical devices uh, one advantage is with uh, one advantage from a mobile telepresence platform is that you, you can actually see the person taking the measurement making sure that the data is accurate before allowing it to be uh, placed in the medical record of the person next step is to make the robot capable of navigating on its own so we have we develop a library called rtam map uh, which is doing visual simultaneous localization and mapping eventually when as the robot is being moved around it's going to co go back to a place where it went before so we do what what's called a loop closure detection and once we have that the robot can synchronize the images that it took and the operator can then determine where's the charging station in the map and say to the robot you can go and charge yourself uh, autonomously. These, this functionality is kind of important because obviously when you're going to be uh, out in the world with the robot, there's going to be latency in terms of network, uh, the network can fail, uh, the person manipulating and uh, operating the robot may have other things to do than just navigate the robot, so you need to be able to have a robot that can, uh, if it needs, go back to the charging station as a basic uh functionality to make sure that doesn't the people from the senior residents uh, doesn't have to take care of the robots it's supposed to be the other way around so so this is what we've done with sam uh, this is another video of another project that wasn't done for uh, health purposes but it's basically the same technology on two other platforms uh, that were designed for security purposes and we showed this uh, to a senior residences and they, they thought that it was a great idea to have that also at their uh, their residence. You can, with the functionalities of our time map, you can provide waypoints and the robot can navigate autonomously to these waypoints according to a specific schedule and record everything that's going on. It could be taking pictures of uh, irregular activities. It can be uh, sounds that are, um, coming from different areas. Uh, you can record also the position of the sound. So if there's something that needs an intervention, you can teleoperate the robot, you can set out an alarm and an operator can take control. So basically what we've done with the, uh, the, the way that we're designing our robots is that we can reuse different elements of autonomy throughout the different platforms uh, and Obviously, what we've done with SAM could be used for uh, this platform, uh, also for surveillance purposes. So that's secure bot. The um, when we talk about we think about providing the robot telepresence capabilities, it needs to be like I was saying before, has the ability to transmit audio, video, and data, and. To do that, we have to move beyond what teams or Skype or zoom can do. Um, and this requires to, for us to build our own platform uh, with, that we call Open Terra. Open Terra Plus is the telehealth version of it. Uh, the uh, idea is that once we've um, we have the ability to teleoperate a robot, you and since we are working with clinicians to identify the needs and the ways to operate the platform, like Sam for doing remote assistance, they came up with the idea of we could actually use this for telehealth sessions, could be exercise sessions, for instance. So OpenTerra Plus is the version of the framework OpenTerra that we designed for our robot like SAM and uh, SecureBot, but designed specifically uh, to conduct telehealth sessions um, with people living in their, their homes in a user-friendly, secure, and confidential way. That means that we can have the server 
be placed in the home or the clinic or in the hospital. It doesn't have to be the Microsoft uh, team server or the Zoom server can be in, in stored or placed at a uh, convenient or appropriate location. So to give you an idea of the workflow of OpenTerra, uh, the, um, what we have set up is uh, basically have uh, uh, the clinicians uh, prepare participant and user lists. It's gonna be sending a, uh, uh, a web link, a unique web link to each participant by email and they connect just by clicking on it. It's through a web browser. And the clinician is going to be initiating the, um, the, uh, the sessions. So to give you a rough idea of what, uh, what is uh, OpenTerra, here's an example of uh, a session, the clinical uh, view on the bottom left. Uh, the, what the, the, the participant sees, the clinician can select the view uh, can add participants. Um, the, uh, we can have uh, up to five, I think. Um, the um, other functionalities that are quite useful is that we can, uh, the clinician can um, control remotely the, uh, the sounds, uh, the, the, the volume, the micro, uh, the, the camera control for the, uh, the participant, which is something that usually uh, can require assistance. When they are doing exercises uh, through these telehealth sessions, you can uh, use timers and countdowns that are being shared with the participant so that uh, the, uh, they can have a common uh, reference. And we can also take pictures uh, and take measurements from these pictures uh, if you want to see how uh, they move their arm for arms, for, in, for instance, and just have this logged into the session uh, so that you can uh, use this data later for uh, diagnosis and follow up. So uh, obviously there's the standard, you know, uh, transmission of uh, sharing of, uh, of uh, screens, but also the ability to have multiple cameras, control pan tilt zoom cameras uh, remotely. And we have all, to, all kinds of tools to facilitate the sessions for the clinician, can manage list of people, groups, projects, uh, can manage uh, who's online, who's active, uh, follow up with statistics if you, uh, if you want to see how uh, the system was used over time, uh, plan or schedule meetings. Um, it can also be used to record, uh, to memorize asynchronous data. So uh, we have connections with, uh, with iPhone, uh, with uh, watches, smart watches, and uh, the system can uh, memorize or take data from, uh, from these, uh, these devices and you can, have, you can have access to this later on. So it's an open source platform. Uh, it was made basically to address these uh, clinical needs and could be used for research or for uh, deployment uh, over a long period of time. It's actually being used in Paris and a couple of clinics. So that's OpenTerra. MapIt is uh, the, uh, the spin-off from the navigation uh, software that I was talking about. Uh, we were showing the, uh, the, the capabilities of autonomous navigation of our, of our, our robot. And we had OTs on the team saying, if you could put this on a phone, uh, we could use that to measure, to create a 3D model of a bathroom or a kitchen or a, a bedroom and derive measurements that we are taking manually when we are doing home assessment. So, uh, a couple of years ago, Asus had uh, this phone that uh, had this uh, capability. Now the uh, iPhone and iPad Pro 12 uh, have a LiDAR uh, on them. So these are devices that can be used. You just scan the room uh, by doing this motion. You're following um, what's being shown on the screen to make sure that you're scanning the entire uh, area. So the, the model is being created as the, rob the, 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 the mobile phone is being moved around. And eventually, uh, let's skip that part, you get a 3D model of 
the actual room that you can use to uh, move around. And uh, by a click of a button, we uh, generate uh, measurements. Uh, we're going to see this uh, in the next couple of seconds. Um, standard measurements of the room. Um, the pre precision is about 1.5 centimeters. Uh, you can also use your mouse to click on different part of the image and get a measurement uh, out of uh, these, uh, these selection directly. If we move uh, one step further, since we are doing loop closure detection to connect uh, the maps or the images, uh, this is a 3D model of an, of an entire house, an entire uh, apartment, uh, to be more precise, with images taken from different regions of uh, the, the apartment. And then you can use it to either take measurements or move around in this uh, 3D model of the residence to make sure that uh, it's safe or uh, how to see how it's organized rather than just taking pictures. The people that haven't been visited, uh, visiting the, this apartment before can have a better sense of uh, the organization and how it's uh, set. So that's uh, another spin-off, like I was saying, of what we, uh, we have designed for robots that actually is being used for uh, uh, technology for he health purposes. What we are working on right now is another robot uh, called T-Top. Uh, it's, it's, it's a robot companion, a tabletop companion. Uh, it has the same type of technology uh, with the microphone array and the uh, 3D camera. Uh, it's a small touch screen that where we could use Open Terra and do telehealth session with it with more, it's a mobile platform. So uh, can provide more interaction uh, with the user rather than just using a tablet. Um, the uh, this same technology is being transferred uh, on the platform. I'm going to skip to the, this part. Uh, the robot can localize itself in the map, just like uh, the other two, even though it's not mobile as mobile as the other. We can do people tracking, joint, joint tracking, and also object recognition. So all of these capabilities are trying to improve the intelligence of these robots and are being shared through the uh, Open Terra framework. So that's basically what I wanted to present. Uh, the, um, if you need more information, I've put the link to the, um, the archive paper just recently published. Uh, you can find out more about the different robots and technology. And if you, um, you, you want to collaborate, please don't hesitate to contact me. The, uh, the everything is like I said open source. We look uh, we, we we look forward to have collaboration with anybody that is interested in contributing to this. Uh, it takes a lot of effort doing these robots and these uh, the creating these tools, and we would move much much far uh, faster, making much uh, much more progress if we can share and have access to these capabilities and extend them over time. So that's pretty much what I. Uh, what I had to present today. Great, thanks very much, Francois. I've got quite a few questions. I'm going to pop them in the chat, and we'll see. If, um, we'll pick those up later on. So, thank you. Uh, really mm -hmm. great work. Okay. So, I'm really pleased to introduce Hannah Bradwell from the University of Plymouth. Hannah is going to talk about um, role of robotics in supporting care of older adults, and just perhaps give us a snapshot of some of the work that's also going off. Uh, going on down in Plymouth. Uh, over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you, Francois. That was really interesting. Uh, yeah, so as Nigel said, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the work uh, that we've had underway at the University of Plymouth, and um, particularly with the EPIC project. Uh, so the background, of course, to, to everything we're speaking about today is the role of technology and robotics in responding to a challenge that we're facing, and that is the increasing pressure on the health and social care sector. Uh, we know that worldwide we've got an aging population and with that we've got an increasing burden of disability, increasing prevalence of dementia and it's also coupled with declining health and social care workforce numbers. So we're expecting technology and um, particularly robotics to be able to respond to this challenge um, and that includes a subset of robots called socially assistive robots uh, with the specific purpose of providing or mediating social companionship and that's the kind of area of most interest uh, at Plymouth University. 
Uh, so down in Plymouth, we've got a couple of projects underway that are relevant in this area. One of which, as I've said, is the EPIC project, which stands for eHealth Productivity and Innovation in Cornwall. Uh, and this project aims to support small and medium sized businesses to develop, test and implement digital health technologies into the health and social care sector. Uh, the second project is the GOLD project, uh, which stands for Generating Older Active Lives Digitally. Uh, and that project aims to bring older people and younger people together in online intergenerational co-production groups to co-design, develop, test digital health products, particularly to support the well-being of older adults around physical activity and reminiscence. Uh, and my role in both projects is specifically focused on the use of those technologies for older adults. Uh, and although our definition of digital health technologies is broad, we look at kind of apps, uh, wearables, virtual reality, extended reality, uh, AI, voice activated smart speakers and whatnot. Of course, uh, we're also very interested in robots. Uh, and also my PhD involved research around the use of robots for older adults. And thanks to Professor Praminda Caleb Solly, who's on the call today, uh, I successfully completed my project exploring the design, use and impact of robot pets and automata for older adults. And that's what I'll particularly focus on in a minute. But in terms of robots that Epic has worked with, uh, and not necessarily me personally, but certainly members of the team, uh, one example is Stevie. So Stevie is a socially assisted robot developed by Professor McGinn um, and the team at Akara, which is a spin out from Trinity College in Dublin. And the Stevie robot responds to speech and gestures and head movements. Uh, so for example, if you said to Stevie that you weren't feeling well, then Stevie would respond by saying, I'm sorry to hear that and kind of slouching and frowning and looking quite sad. Or if you complimented Stevie, then it would smile and it would be pleased. And so it would provide kind of an emotional response and emotional conversations. Uh, and so some of the EPIC team have previously trialed Stevie at a dementia daycare centre uh, where the robot provided entertainment and an engagement and dancing and uh, physical activity lessons and bingo. And it was a real hit among, among the, the customers there. And it also freed up staff time for some of the more chronic needs while providing that meaningful activity for a, a larger group of older people. Uh, and the importance of you know, providing meaningful activity Activity for older people can't be overstated. We know that meaningful activity is associated with improvements in quality of life uh, and it's also important for physical and mental health. Another robot uh, that we're working with within Epic is the Viasense robot from Innova. Uh, so this is a telepresence robot, which obviously Francois has given us lots of brilliant information around telepresence. Um, but the Viasense robot, the company suggests the robot will assist with the predicted shortage of caregivers for the rapidly aging population. Uh, and we're taking a delivery of a Viasense soon, and we're quite interested in using the Viasense uh, in care homes to facilitate those kind of virtual doctor's rounds uh, and facilitate video consultations. Uh, another device that's uh, been part of the EPIC journey is the Genie Connect. I'm not sure if we've got a representative on the call, but uh, Genie facilitates video calls and audio chats and can also provide reminders for medication and appointments and well-being. I can also respond to voice and to chat, so providing that companionship uh, can answer questions and play music. And it can also learn likes and dislikes so that it can actually provide that kind of stimulating content per person uh, and make sure that we're maintaining active minds for older adults as well. It can also help connect people to other people, so that kind of mediating social contact as well as just providing social contact. Uh, and I think that that's been involved in some extra care type research in Cornwall. Uh, finally, we have the Compet, which is from a SME called Robotrix, who are another SME that was working with Epic. Uh, and Compet is a prototype robot, so as you can see, it's not currently got any skin on. Uh, it's still under development, but the purpose of that robot is to provide a more affordable alternative to the famous Paro robot seal. Um, but the aim of Compet is to kind of better match user-centered requirements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our studies into user-centered requirements now and focus specifically on robot pets and zoomorphic devices. Uh, but the background for robot pets generally is that we know live animals and interactions with live animals can be beneficial for health and well-being. However, there are contexts where live animals are less appropriate, and particularly when we're talking about the care of older adults in care homes or in hospitals. Uh, so that's why Paro was developed, uh, the seal in Japan as a robot alternative that doesn't come with any risks of bites or scratches or allergies. And also the robot can't be injured itself. So there's a wealth of research around the impacts of Paro for older adults, um, including uh, reducing agitation, reducing depression, reducing loneliness, more adaptive stress response, uh, lowering blood pressure, less reliance on pharmaceuticals. So lots of really important health and well-being benefits from something as simple as a, as a robot pet. 
So in total, we did about 13 studies specifically on kind of robot pets and, and interactive animal toys, uh, looking at the design requirements for these devices, but also the use and impact of these zoomorphic devices. Uh, and what we did was we compared uh, a range of commercially available robots and alternative automata and interactive toys. Uh, and that was the eight devices you can see on the right there. And they were selected to provide a range of aesthetics, features, abilities, and level of sophistication uh, to provide that comparison. And so for one of the first of those studies, we conducted a comparison of end users, so older adults, um, and developers, so roboticists, and we compared their perceptions towards a suitable robot pets design for older adults. And we felt that the results demonstrated real value in having a user-centered design because there were significant differences between the developers and the end users in what they felt an end user should want from a robot pet. Uh, and so our older adults much preferred familiar animals that they could relate to, so they preferred the cat and the dog, uh, and they demonstrate quite poor acceptability towards Paro, uh, thinking that actually unfamiliar animals were, were kind of more toy-like because they weren't so congruent with the setting, you wouldn't be likely to see a seal and they felt that that made it more like a toy than, than a replacement for a pet. Uh, whereas the roboticists were more positive about Paro, thinking that actually kind of being intentionally unfamiliar was a good thing and um, would reduce any expectations of the device for abilities that it couldn't achieve. So following that study we uh, conducted a number of different studies with a range of, of stakeholders and a, a broad sample, but generally around preferences and perceptions towards uh, the device design. So we had focus groups with older adults and care home residents themselves, uh, also focus groups and interviews with family, uh, care staff, and also surveys with health and social care professionals around dementia and psychiatry and gerontology. And together they all suggested some interesting design requirements. Uh, so particularly the need for the device to be a familiar animal that people could relate to, so something that they may have had as a pet in the past. Uh, definitely for it to be realistic and to look lifelike, to have soft fur, uh, to have life simulation features was quite an interesting one. People were really interested in it breathing or having a heartbeat or having simulated warmth. Uh, eye contact was seen as really important, particularly for robots designed to be social. Uh, it was really important that it was cleanable and could be um, maintained to a hygienic standard. And it was also important that it was affordable. Uh, and for our stakeholders, their perception of affordable was around 225 to 250 pounds. So again and again, over kind of a number of different studies, we saw the preferred device being the joy for all cat and the dog. Uh, so the dog, cat and dog you can see in the middle of the, the line up there. And the reasons behind preferring these kind of familiar cat and dog were the relatability, uh, being able to reminisce over pets from the past, pets that ha people had had previously, uh, the fact that there could be an intuitive interaction, um, and like I said, feeling less like it was a toy. Um, and so potentially you've got less issues of, of being infantilizing there. The familiar devices did trigger expectations in line with the live cats and dogs, but this wasn't seen as a negative because like I said, it enabled that kind of natural interaction. And it also prompted positive schemas of the loving relationships people had had with cats or dogs in the past. Uh, and so kind of despite that, um, acceptability and preference for these kind of familiar, affordable, less sophisticated automata, the literature is of course dominated with paro studies, uh, so there wasn't much research into the potential for these kind of cheaper devices to produce the well-being benefits for older adults uh, that we know we know that paro can achieve. Uh, so initially we reported on a longitudinal diary study, so over two sites and over six months uh, where they implemented Joy for All Cats and Dogs. And qualitatively, we saw reductions in agitation, in de-escalating emotional situations, and also generally just creating positive experiences. So then, as I said, based on those prior studies, it was looking really positive for these kind of cheaper, more affordable devices. And so we selected the Joy for All Cat and Dog to go forwards into another trial. And we selected them as the what we felt were the most user-centered currently available devices that we looked at in that they were embodied as familiar domestic animals that people would have experience with. Uh, they were also the appropriate size and weight for people's older people's laps, which we found to be quite important. And they also best matched the user context on price. So these devices are around 100 pounds, 150 pounds, whereas the Paro, the seal is around 5,000 pounds. So there's quite a big gap in, in affordability there. Uh, these ones were also uh, soft and furry and relatively realistic. Uh, and the dog has a heartbeat, so it's, it's matching that kind of life stimulation requirement as well. 
Uh, and so with that kind of initial qualitative diary data from the six month study, it did look like it was worth exploring um, these cheaper devices a bit further. So what we did was we conducted a stratified cluster randomized controlled trial in eight care homes. Uh, there are 253 residents in those homes in total and we had 83 consented for direct data collection. So then the care homes were randomly allocated uh, into stratified pairs. So we stratified based on average age and average dementia severity in those homes. And then the two groups of four homes were randomized. Four homes received joyful cats and dogs and four homes received uh, care as usual. We completed psychometrics at baseline and follow-up. Uh, so that was with the 83 residents who consented to have direct data. And then we also had qualitative data collected throughout that was on, on all 253 uh, who had the opportunity to interact with the robots. Uh, so their data was collected qualitatively through the members of staff who were observing uh, day to day and then completing interviews at the end of the study. So for the results, uh, 54 out of those 81 residents were reported to interact with the robots and 85% of those who interacted were reported to have positive experience. Uh, the residents who did interact, uh, we found could be considered at the higher end of moderate dementia, while the residents who did not interact would be considered to have no or mild dementia and they chose not to interact. We saw significantly greater reduction in neuropsychiatric symptoms and occupational disruptiveness for the intervention groups. That was a really interesting result. Uh, we didn't see any difference for any ability in communication and we didn't see any difference for challenging behaviour. In terms of the subscales we looked at, we saw significantly greater reduction in delusions, depression, anxiety, elation and apathy for the residents who received the joyful cats and dogs. The qualitative results also supported the impact of those affordable devices on entertainment, anxiety, agitation and boredom. So really, really, really promising results for, for affordable devices. In terms of kind of what, what next? Um, obviously, we've, we've got some ideas down at Plymouth that we think would be really nice to look at. We think it could be quite interesting to look at developing a robot that is designed to kind of intentionally match those user centered requirements and, and also the context with kind of the price and the hygiene. Um, and then look at the impact of having that user centered de device design on well being and also long term engagement, because a lot of our studies have been quite short term engagements. It could also be interesting to look at designing robots for adaptability. Uh, for the robot kind of through the journey of aging uh, as, as needs change, uh, but also for variable moods and requirements. So something we saw throughout all of our studies is that people like the robots for different reasons and get different benefits from the robots. And sometimes that changes throughout the day. So there may be older adults who become quite agitated in the morning or quite agitated in the evening. And perhaps a robot could be soothing at those times, but then throughout the day could be entertaining and engaging. Uh, and with this, I guess they could also be interested, uh, interested in looking at the use of voice or sentiment analysis or wearables like heart rate to actually monitor the signs of anxiety or signs of agitation and then have the robot adapt its behavior accordingly. Uh, some things uh, that we've come up with, um, come across to bear in mind, things that perhaps we weren't expecting as well. Uh, cost, it wasn't something that we were gonna, we were um, anticipating to be such a barrier, but particularly in the care of older adults and in, in, in our social care context, cost is really important. Uh, the research that we did suggests that there is a limited investment potential in our social care sector, uh, particularly for robot pets, and that the stakeholder driven appropriate cost was around that £225. And so that's got implications for future robots developed at this sector. Also ethics, which I know Praminda is going to talk much more about, but, but it's something to bear in mind as well in that the literature does report some concerns around kind of infantilization and deceit, uh, care or convenience, potential for harm, accountability, and also reductions in human contact, which is something when you're talking about robots for the care of older adults, you've always got to bear in mind that kind of importance of human contact. Um, and also cleanliness, uh, that's something that we've, we've looked at before and is, is again really important. So all robots and devices for older adults um, and for older adults in care homes as well should have thought given to the cleanliness and infection control. So we know from one of our prior studies that robot pets in particular uh, can get unacceptably high microbial loads following just one group session with older adults. And in light of COVID-19 and a particular impact on care homes and vulnerable older people, um, then we've got to put some thought into kind of shared use uh, and cleaning of robots used for, for older adults as well. Uh, so some contact details, which is of course also a pitch for collaboration. 
Uh, the EPIC project in particular would be very interested to hear from any small or medium sized businesses, uh, particularly if they're interested in working in Cornwall with us to develop, test, implement new technology or robots in health and social care. And also the gold project would be keen to hear about any kind of robots or technologies that you may wish to pilot or get some kind of co-production feedback um, from our group of, of older adults as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Really great work. It's not easy to get a study with a large number of participants like that. So I think you did really well. So good. I've posted some questions in the chat just to remind others to do so. Great stuff. Thank you. OK, so our third speaker this afternoon is Praminda, or this morning, if you're in Canada, um, is, is uh, Praminda Caleb Sorry from the Bristol Robotics Laboratory. Uh, Praminda is going to focus on some of the regulatory, legal and ethical challenges around using robotics. Over to you, Praminda. Uh, you're on mute, Praminda. OK, there. Can you see my screen? Yeah, OK, I'm just going to arrange everything. So it's uh, so I've got two screens here. Uh, so thanks um, for that introduction, Nigel. Um, so when we've been looking at assistive robots in the lab to um, support independent living, we found a lot of potential opportunity. And uh, in the research that we've been doing, um, this particular piece of work, which was sponsored by the Shoring Autonomy International Program, uh, ha has brought to the fore uh, some of the challenges in ensuring that these robots actually get out into uh, the settings for which we're designing them. And um, what I'm going to present to you is sort of a range of issues that we've um, identified um, and particularly also looking at, and Hannah mentioned this, with people's changing needs, uh, some of the issues that arise, particularly in relation to ensuring continued relevance uh, of the technology, but also safety related issues. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to cover the context of particularly focusing on physically assistive robots, um, accessibility needs and safety related concerns, looking at some of the regulatory, legal and ethical issues and some concluding remarks. So um, the people who we are designing this technology for have a complex uh, range of multiple diseases and conditions, and no two people are likely to have identical sets of needs. And the complexity of impairments that has to be considered is compounded further by the fact that not only do people have more than one condition, but these occur along a multidimensional continuum and can change over time in a non-deterministic manner. And actually, they can even change over a period of a day. And the severity of impairments can change as well. And I've illustrated this here in relation to the Rockwood uh, clinical frailty scale. Uh, we did some work a few years back with a care home provider, and this is a tag cloud of just 20 of their service users for whom they were providing home support services. If you look at the range of comorbidities in just a small cohort, um, and as a result of these illnesses, people have a varying range of impairments, which, like I said, results not only in very different experiences, but impairments which are related to mobility, vision, hearing, uh, we need to start to consider how the robot can continue to perform at the level required and being able to provide the information in a way so that to the person it's accessible and that interaction can be clearly understood and be safe. And so from a usability point of view, we need to consider which modality will be most useful in um, providing that support and also how it could be adapted or configured as the user's needs change. And this is particularly important if we're going to consider it from a safety perspective, because problems with incorrect perception or interpretation of information will be quite, um, will result in quite a few hazardous uh, conditions. So what we need to consider is not only that the robot assistance is adaptable, but how it is going to adapt and who decides at what, when it adapts and to what extent it adapts. So robots by definition are systems that are able to sense their environment and change their behavior and therein 
lies the problem and the challenges. So in addition to um, people's particular clinical, cognitive or psychological needs, we also have to consider the operational conditions, which are going to be very complex and multivariate. And so in thinking about design methods, and Hannah mentioned also user-centered design approaches, uh, we started to look at whether these design approaches also consider safety-related issues as well. Um, and um, over the last eight to 10 years, we've seen a number of new robot platforms emerge, and I should say disappear or start to disappear. Some of you might have heard about um, um, SoftBank putting um, Pepper on the shelf for a bit. Um, and one of the things that we've been looking at is the level of physical assistance required, for example, an older person with disabilities that vary along that continuum, the frailty, uh, um, clinical frailty uh, index, and um, how that might vary and how difficult it is to be able to determine in, re in terms of the level of physical assistance and the physicality of the assistance or interaction that's needed. And so to be able to develop standards that are um, able to address issues related to safety and then working towards putting together regulations, you can see how complex the situation is. And so just to give you some um, examples of physically assisted robots that we've been investigating in the British Robotics Lab, uh, we've been looking at the LEA um, assistive walker, which also is now out of production. Uh, and we've been developing our own system in the Bristol Robotics Lab, the Chiron Juva system to provide um, sit to stand support and, and walking. Uh, and it's um, operated uh, as part of uh, an existing hoist ceiling rail platform. Uh, and you can see some of the functional supports that um, physically assistive robots offer. And ensuring operational safety of such physically assistive robots in a range of real world contexts, as I said, represents a major limiting barrier to deployment. And one of the things we're finding is that people aren't looking at these in conjunction with the development of the platform. So these need to happen hand in hand. And as part of our project, we've reviewed some of the existing regulatory conditions uh, consideration to assistive robots. And we find that there are a number of technical regulatory and care standards that also need to be considered. And of course, these will vary in different countries as well. And the most uh, relevant one of these we've found is the safety assurance standard is the BS 13482, which covers risk assessment and hazard identification, and also um, includes consideration of other types of hazards such as the physical characteristics and the motion of the system, the components, ergonomics, etc. However, we found that there are key gaps when considering how changing needs of a user with a progressive condition, so this is where their physical and cognitive ability changes can be addressed by such a system, and how does one ensure that um, the system is still safe to operate. And when we talk about safety, um, we found that many of the older industry standards tend to cover only mechanical safety uh, and aspects of passive interactive technology. So if the assistive robots are to be used for movement and handling of people and supporting them with mobility needs, then we need more done around being able to address and actually I start to identify risks and also the training that will be needed by the care providers who are supporting this technology, so maintaining it, keeping it calibrated, et cetera. Uh, and in relation to um, physically assisted robots, we've reviewed a range of um, related uh, regulations, such as lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations, and, and these um, provide some useful insight into 
um, strategies for inspection and maintenance and how they're to be certified and how the training of the people operating these systems needs to also be considered and certified. And at the moment, we've got a live um, uh, survey out to carers, uh, clinicians, therapists, uh, occupational therapists and physiotherapists. And I can post a link later on if any of you are on this um, webinar today are in the area because we are interested to hear of your experiences and your um, ideas about how we begin to address these issues. Um, so one of the things that uh, we think it's important to consider is about the methods that we use and develop to actually conduct comprehensive risk assessments. Uh, and um, one of my colleagues on the project, uh, Dr. Chris Harper, has been working for quite a few years on developing environmental survey hazard analysis um, approach. And you can read about it in one of our recent papers here. Uh, and we've been looking at how existing approaches, uh, you know, where the gaps are with the uh, existing approaches, but also where approaches from other um, areas and domains could accelerate our understanding and development of these processes. And one of the ones that we've um, identified, which is looking very promising, um, is the ecological interface design. It was uh, introduced specifically for socio-technical real-time complex dynamic systems. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we want to do to help progress the development and uptake of these systems is um, to have researchers working in assistive robotics to start to consider these methods and approaches because when it comes to certifying uh, the systems, you can then say how you have developed the system in relation to these methods as well. Um, I just want to say a little bit about some of the legal considerations, and we all know there are going to be issues with data and data privacy, but one of the things, again, that I think we've, well, we found hasn't been considered enough is about this point nine here, who is responsible when the robot decides not to provide support? And that's quite an interesting one, because if you look at robots providing assistance to somebody, where there is also an uh, aspiration to work towards functional independence. And that is about being able to address people's um, ability to stop them being dependent on the technology and become more independent. So we want to reduce frailty by encouraging people to move more. And if the robot then decides that they are going, it is a good time or a good opportunity to encourage the person to rely less on the system and then there's an accident, what happens then? So we're looking at, and we're discussing this with how therapists approach the problem and then trying to see whether we can bring some of that learning into the development of um, the systems. And this is actually going to become very important if we're going to think about the pragmatics of getting insurance and, and getting uh, people to adopt these technologies because uh, we need to start to think about, and there's some interesting work that's been done with uh, Bertoloni and uh, uh, his uh, colleagues, and you can read about this in uh, a paper from 2016, there's been some more work, but I think there's not enough work being done in what we've added to this, which is around what we're calling clinical damage, which is over-dependence and overuse of a system, which can then result in um, less uh, in, in, in the underdevelopment of the person's own ability uh, to be able to be independent. And again, um, Hannah mentioned some of these issues related to ethical um, aspects of uh, ethical challenges of the use of robots. And here we've got quite a few that we are uh, aware of uh, already, which have been uh, adapted from a work by Shannon Valor. Uh, but where we are seeing, again, there is potential to be able to consider these in more detail is, yes, we know what the possible ethical challenges are, 
but do we know how to relate the particular robot platform in relation to these challenges? And again, we've been doing some work uh, with uh, one of my PhD students, ex-PhD students, who's finished now, uh, Katie Winkle, where um, we looked at uh, addressing uh, ethical risk from uh, anthropomorphism. So uh, robots that look too humanoid and what that means in terms of some of the existing ethical hazards as defined in um, 8611. And so uh, to conclude and give enough time for people to ask questions, um, I'd just like to focus on these three particular areas. One of them is um, to think about um, the implications and impact on human human interaction and how emerging uh, rules and laws uh, relate to what we are designing and developing and how to make these align because one of the things we found while there's very good intention in developing these new uh, laws and regulations they're often from people who haven't actually worked with assistive robots and we see a sort of mismatch in in uh, what people think is uh, fine from um, a clinical perspective and, and while it might not sit quite right with somebody outside of the area, trying to address some of the out challenges of maintaining uh, dignity and uh, supporting independence, which is what we're trying to do. Um, thinking about changing complex use and needs um, and um, addressing a full spectrum of um, uh, unmet needs that need to be addressed. Uh, and then thinking about not just gaps in regulations and standards, but also in our methods to be able to identify what the issues are in the first place. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Raminda. Thanks, everyone. I know we're we're uh, kind of cutting close on time here, so I'll get right to the questions. Uh, the first questions I'll combine two that came as they're similar, and that was uh, really for the panel in general. It's how prolific are commercially available uh, telepresence robots um, in the older adult segment in general, as well as specific to care home settings. And, and you can answer for the UK or in Canada as appropriate. So that's the first question I'll put out there. So should I try to, uh, to start? Sure. Professor. I think there's it's still quite limited. Um, and what we are uh, observing is that uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm when they get in touch with the technology and try to try it and uh, get to see how it's uh, beneficial. But their first reflex is to go back to uh, the natural way of doing it. So that's one thing. Uh, usability is an issue. Uh, so that's what we need to demonstrate. So and to answer also the other questions, we're trying to put robots into the real world. So we're what we are doing as experiments is that we're bringing, for instance, the Beam Plus, and we have we have a Beam Plus platform now, a standard platform in a residence. It's, a, it's been there for a couple of months now, and we're trying to get measurements from them. And they, they are, like I said, very enthusiastic, but when we're not there, they, they're scared of breaking the technology. And even though we can tell them, you know, don't worry, we're going to repair it, no worries. They're kind of still figuring it out. So that's one thing. Uh, we're going to be putting SAM next so that we're going to be able to compare the standard theme, uh, the telepresent platform without any autonomy with uh, one that has autonomous capabilities. So it's kind of a, we don't want to skip steps because if we start with the more evolved robot, we may kind of get a negative bias for the standard one. So, and it's a, it's a, process of getting familiarized with the technology. So the idea is to put them uh, as much as possible close to the technology. We had a robot in a residential home and it took nine months for the person to figure out that she could actually use the platform to monitor her Alzheimer patient uh, once she was going out and got her to buy a cell phone. So we need to get these robots out there and to get to observe and learn from uh, from what uh, what we uh, we get from experience with them. So uh, so usability benefits versus costs, and um, uh, that's pretty much what we need to demonstrate as researchers before it can uh, expand commercially. Great. Thanks for that, Francois. I don't know if uh, Hannah or Perminda, you want to add anything on on that? 
Francis? Yes, um, yeah, so just to echo what Francis said, and um, we recently worked on a knowledge partner, a transfer partnership with a large national care provider in a uh, residential village provider in the UK. And we had the robots, the telepresence robots sitting there for quite a long time, providing the support, even though we had somebody to help. Uh, and it was during COVID that people suddenly realized what the uh, benefits um, the technology could bring. Um, but again, one of the things, gaps we found was that uh, care organizations need the support to help them with maintaining the systems, uh, providing the training on how to use the systems, uh, and um, also being there, uh, like said, for the general maintenance, but also this technology is still developing. So there are new versions coming online, you know, new releases coming online. And so as part of the knowledge transfer partnership, we saw a gap in the UK market and we've set up a, a community interest company called Robotics for Good. Uh, and we are again um, trying by offering the service to um, to trial these technologies, hopefully um, getting them out there to um, uh, once people start to use them uh, for them to start to realize how they beneficial they might be. Okay, great. And I know we're, we're over time, so apologies for that, but thank you all for joining and, and thanks to the great panelists for all their input here and, and insights as well. It's clear that there's a lot of activity going on and to an initial point when we were starting here, there's room for collaboration that will hopefully keep accelerating this sector forward. And I think we saw those opportunities here. Hopefully these sessions will facilitate that. So please do feel free to reach out to us. You'll get a quick survey about this. Um, I think one of the feedback will be we should leave more time for, for these sessions, but it's great to have these conversations and we hope to facilitate more discussion in the future. So. Thanks again, and thanks so much to everyone for joining. Thank you. I'm happy to look Thank at some all. of those chat questions and answer them if people want to stay online. Let's see if there's anything.